Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, over the course of the next 30, 40 minutes, I have been asked to share with you uh, the current uh, understanding about management of differentiated carcinoma of the thyroid gland, and I will try to do justice to the topic. Uh, this is a very interesting topic, and uh, a lot of debate and controversy takes place when you go to meetings about this particular disease. However, before I begin, I want to draw your attention to one fact. Some of the faculty members were at dinner last night. How many of you had an opportunity to look at the menu carefully, particularly the left-hand side of the menu? The left-hand side of the menu had shown this. So I want to assure you that this presentation will be without alcohol. <laughs> All right. Uh, in this time frame, I'll try to cover with you uh, the rising incidence of uh, differentiated carcinoma of the thyroid gland, uh, its pathology as we were taught, and as we understand today. The practice patterns as promulgated by conventional thought processes, largely driven by endocrinologists, uh, the importance of uh, prognostic factors in selection of therapy, uh, risk group stratification of patients as they come to you prior to treatment, which would then help you in selection of therapy. Uh, what follow-up schedule you should maintain for what group of patients. And uh, finally, I'll conclude with where we should be heading in future in terms of improving upon the outcomes of this very favorable of cancers that we treat. Uh, worldwide, if you note, notice, uh, the incidence of uh, differentiated carcinoma of the thyroid gland is rising. I've, I'm sharing with you here the uh, incidence uh, data from the United States uh, from 1974 to 2006. The annual incidence of newly diagnosed thyroid cancer has literally tripled. In 1974, we used to see about 8,000 new carcinomas of thyroid per year in the United States uh, last year that number exceeded 30,000, a, a, a rise of over 300% over that past 20-25 uh, year period. And if you look at this data published by the SEER group in the United States, it has been claimed to be, and rightfully so, the fastest rising cancer in the United States. Now put this slide on CNN or your, or your local news and you will have a scare in the public. Fastest rising cancer. Your consulting rooms will be flooded with women who have felt nodules in, your, in their neck because they have thyroid cancer. So I think you know, we need to put things in perspective. The fastest rising cancer, which it is called, rightfully so, is truly a favorable cancer. Go back to my previous slide. Even though the incidence has literally tripled, the mortality to the disease has remained exactly the same. We do not lose more lives from thyroid cancer than we did 25 years ago. It translates into the fact that we are diagnosing curable, early staged, favorable cancers which do not have impact on life. Good news. Now, uh, this is a unique neoplasm, and I, I call it unique neoplasm for a variety of reasons. One of that is that multicentric microscopic foci of this tumor are quite common, both within the thyroid gland and also uh, disseminated to regional lymph nodes in the neck, something akin to what you see in prostate cancer. This is a cancer which is biologically symbiotic to normal life. In the United States, the incidence of occult carcinoma found at autopsy in people dying of other causes is about 10%. That incidence rises to 35% in Finland and somewhere in between in the rest of the world. So this is a biologically occult cancer in a, a large number of patients. Even though microscopical dissemination may be as high as 60 to 80% within the thyroid gland itself, 
and nearly 50% of the patients will have occult metastasis to the lymph nodes in the neck. Its impact on outcome or its clinical significance still remains obscure. Now, many of you sitting in the audience who are out 20, 25 years after your medical school would realize that the, we were taught in medical schools that thyroid cancer comes in four flavors, papillary carcinoma, follicular carcinoma, medullary carcinoma, and anaplastic carcinoma. That was true then, but I think as we understand the disease today, that is not quite so. This is the same disease which goes, I will exclude medullary carcinoma, it is not a cancer of thyroid follicular cell origin. It's a cancer of the supporting cells, the C cells. It's a different disease altogether. And my comments for the rest of the time will not be germane to medullary carcinoma. It will be only uh, on cancers derived from the follicular cell origin. We know that the follicular cell of the normal thyroid gland uh, may differentiate into a papillary carcinoma or a follicular carcinoma. Majority of the patients who come to you for treatment stop right there. Nearly 80% of the patients will come to you at this stage of biological progression of their cancer, carrying a good prognosis, which I call a good cancer. A small percentage may go on further with the right stimulus and the right environment to go on to a more undifferentiated variant with aggressive behavior, tall cell carcinoma, insular carcinoma, and may go on to progress to a poorly differentiated carcinoma and eventually anaplastic carcinoma. Now, you may logically ask me, do you have any evidence to show that such biological progression takes place? Well, unfortunately, we can't grow thyroid cancer cells in the lab from here to here and show you. That will be prima facie evidence if I could show you that. That's not technically feasible. But there are two other indirect ways to see it. If you look at patients who come to you with either a tall cell variant of thyroid cancer or a poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma, and if you serially section their thyroid gland, you will find areas which are very well differentiated within the same tumor, indicating that parts of the tumor started off here is still well differentiated while other parts of the tumor have gone on to show the aggressive behavior. One indirect means of uh, supporting this hypothesis. Other uh, means of supporting this hypothesis is that many patients who develop multiple recurrences of differentiated carcinoma, of papillary carcinoma, and get treated, and if you go back to the pathology laboratory and pull out all the slides from their original surgery, first recurrence, second recurrence, fourth recurrence, and serially study these slides, you will find evidence that early on, it was a differentiated carcinoma, and with each recurrence, there has been progressive metaplasia going towards this progression model. So there is another indirect evidence to indicate that such tumor progression does occur for differentiated carcinoma. Fortunately, a great majority of patients will remain with the same diagnosis of well-differentiated thyroid cancer and will be cured by the initial surgical intervention. They will not have anything further that will develop. They will not require any further treatment. A very small proportion, about 10%, more or less, will develop local or regional recurrence, but it will not have negative impact on their prognosis. Yes, they will require treatment, but they will not die of that disease. And mortality in this group of patients, and I draw your attention to the previous slide, these are nearly 80% of the patients who will be here, mortality in that group is under 2%. And I will share data with you, not only from my institution, but from the institution of Dr. Kerry Olson, who is also sitting in the audience. So how does uh, this understanding of biological progression impact upon your understanding of the disease and, uh, and its management. As this biological progression from a well-differentiated to a poorly differentiated ca cancer begins and progresses, mortality increases. Logical uh, extrapolation. And as that, uh, that uh, occurs, 
the uh, differentiation of the tumor from a well differentiated to this will clearly diminish. Its impact then being, as differentiation diminishes, the ability for the pathologist to help us and the biochemist to help us follow the patients will become less and less applicable. These tumors do not strain for thyroglobulin or TTF1. Neither will these tumors have thyroglobulin as an accurate biomarker for the activity of that disease uh, available to you in follow-up. So the, the lack of differentiation with progression will reduce your ability to use the thyroglobulin producing biomarkers or histochemical markers becomes less applicable. As differentiation diminishes, cell division increases. Therefore, metabolism within the tumor will be more, uh, more, uh, uh, more active, and that facet will now help you in a different manner to manage the patient. Patients who have well-differentiated tumors produce thyroglobulin, and they are iodine avid, and therefore, Radioiodine scanning and radioiodine therapy would be applicable in the well differentiated tumors. Conversely, as you progress here, differentiation diminishes, cell division increases, metabolism increases, radioiodine becomes ineffective in diagnosis and therapy, but your PET scan will be an important tool of diagnosis for these tumors here to. Uh, diagnose recurrence or distant metastasis and thus help you in uh, your management of the patient when the tumor has progressed or metastasized. Uh, also occurring with this progression uh, are uh, um, uh, genomic changes and a number of biomarkers and uh, uh, losses and gains have been identified and, uh, and uh, uh, genetic markers have been identified. Unfortunately, none of us have yet become clinically applicable. Take, for example, here. As the progression takes place, the instability increases, and you find gains and losses at various loci um, uh, on, the, uh, on the tumor molecule and uh, uh, similar uh, changes in the, uh, in the biomarkers. Uh, Red PTC, at least for medullary carcinoma, is a highly reliable marker. And maybe it's a reliable marker even for papillary carcinoma, but it's still a work in progress. So BRAF and red PTC may be, uh, may be applicable, but none of the others, although shown in laboratory studies to be identifiable, reproducible biomarkers, they are yet not clinically applicable. What is clinically applicable is, uh, let me go back two slides, is uh, the presenting features of the tumor. As this progression takes place, the tumors will no longer remain small. It will be extremely unusual for you to find a one centimeter size poorly differentiated carcinoma of the thyroid gland. Let me ask the audience, how many of you have seen a one centimeter poorly differentiated carcinoma of the thyroid gland? Doesn't occur. That tumor is going to get big. So we rely on size. That tumor is going to break out of the thyroid gland, so we rely on extra thyroid extension as a indirect manifestation of the tumor progression. Ris risk of distant metastasis will increase and hence the mortality will go high. So we have clinical parameters on which we have to rely today until such time that we are able to get the biomarkers. Now if you look at the current practice patterns, and I mentioned that to you at the outset, both the American Thyroid Association, the British Thyroid Association, BTA, and the European uh, thyroid group recommend total or near total thyroidectomy as initial treatment for most ca papillary carcinomas which are larger than 1.5 centimeter in diameter. These are published guidelines. This to be followed by radioiodine ablation, radioiodine therapy, and then follow these patients with thyroglobulin and ultrasound. So far it looks fine and dandy, but do you need all this in all the patients that you treat, particularly the great majority of patients who will be at the left hand of the tumor progression model, nearly 80% of the patients. If we follow this practice, a majority of the patients will get excessive treatment at great cost, but with little or no benefit. Some might derive benefit, 
and some may have no impact regardless of how much intervention you provide, particularly if they happen to be 